I'm Greg Tanaka, founder and CEO of Percolata, and today we're interviewing Professor Sergey Nedison. Sergey Nedison is the Timken Shared Professor of Global Technology and Innovation at INSEAD and the Research Director of INSEAD Warren Alliance. He worked on business model innovations with numerous organizations, including Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, Rolls-Royce, and Comcast. Professor Nedison is a frequent speaker on innovation at major events, including World Knowledge Forum at Seoul and World Economic Forum at Davos. His work has received extensive media coverage in CIO Magazine, The Economist, Forbes, New York Times, and U.S. News. Recently, he co-authored The Risk-Driven Business Model, Four Questions That Will Define Your, your Company, by Harvard Business Press 2014. Welcome, Professor Nedison. Uh, thank you, Greg, for uh, having me. So, Professor Nelson, what has been the effect of increased technology on consumer traffic and shopping habits? Um, so, uh, the effect has been uh, has been quite enormous. Um, I think uh, the consumer uh, consumer is changing, um, and shopping habits are changing as a result. And and there are multiple effects, uh, starting from. Uh, for example, multi-channel shopping, uh, where uh, you know consumers uh, overflow from, say, shopping online first and then going to a shopping mall, or uh, vice versa, or even uh, comparing um, anything that they see in a in a retail shop uh, with whatever they can see online. Uh, getting additional product information. Uh, nowadays, what we know is that a lot of consumers before shopping in a, in a physical location, they do a lot of research online. Um, and so uh, by seeing uh, the traffic that goes through the website, you can somewhat predict uh, uh, traffic that might go through a physical store. Um, so uh, all of this is happening, and then of course there is uh, increasing development of uh, on-location technologies, where retailers try to send all kinds of push uh, notifications, real-time discounts. Uh, some more advanced retailers are experimenting with uh, other things like dynamic pricing within the store, and so on and so forth. But all of this is of course is in uh, early stages of development, and and most of uh, most of retail is still very much traditional and doesn't use much of this technology. It's very interesting. You know, it's, what's interesting also is, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, you had companies like Amazon or these peer play retailers who thought that, you know, having all the shopping is going to happen online. But some of the recent statistics out there show that online is still only maybe about 6 to 8% of retail here in the United States and something like 92% of retail is still offline. And then you have retailers even like Amazon or Warby Parker or traditional pure play retailers who've started opening physical stores. So how do you think the role of physical stores and, and online is going to change in the future? Um, I think certainly there is going to be a very large proportion of uh, consumer population that will continue shopping in physical stores no matter what. Um, and, and although if you look at the growth rate of online versus physical um, shopping. Uh, online shopping is still growing much, much faster. Um, but nevertheless, um, nevertheless, I think for a big range of products, uh, people will like to touch and feel and, you know, compare and try it on. Um, and so um, the physical shopping is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, I think, again, maybe the format will change a little bit. There's going to be much more technology involved, you know, a lot of multi-channel shopping, uh, you know, trying offline and then purchasing online. All of those things will happen increasingly, uh, but uh, brick and mortar retail is not going away anytime soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I, I would think the world would be very boring if you walked on the street and there were no retail shops. But um, given that these changes happening online and in the physical world, what, in your opinion, is the optimal business model in retail? Uh, well, um, this is a very difficult question to answer. So um, I think um, I think uh, uh, the optimal business model will very much depend on in which segment you are and um, you know what what kind of uh, market you are serving is it a high end market or low end market 
Um, uh, and um, the good example there is uh, grocery retail, where uh, the the business models have been evolving since you know first internet uh, boom, um, when uh, when companies like Web Webvan went bankrupt. Uh, and then companies have been trying all kinds of delivery modes, you know, crowdsourcing delivery, picking up from retail store sh- uh, shelves. Um, and then uh, still uh, we, go, we go back to some of the companies uh, basically trying to build the same business model as Webvan had. Um, so I think we're going to be looking for business models, uh, the optimal business models for a while, um, and they will be different for different segments of retail. But if I go back to my book and, you know, to the risk driven business model book um, that uh, I recently uh, published, um, what we talk about in this book is uh, thinking about what kind of inefficiencies or risks exist in existing business models. And I think for um, um, brick and mortar retail business, the biggest risk is really information and efficiency, not having information about what is going on within the retail store. Um, so, you know, this last uh, mile or last hundred meters or feet, if you, if you will, of a retail is still a, a mystery to a lot of product manufacturers because they have no visibility of what's happening in the retail store, which products customer picked up, how many customers walked in, how many past the uh, you know a uh, shelf uh, how many of them maybe tried a product on but didn't buy and you know all this kind of information uh, amazon.com has but most physical retail stores have no idea what's going on there so what are retailers trying to do about this the retailers or manufacturers trying to do about this kind of blindness they have at this this last mile or last few feet if you are a physical retailer you can probably uh, put video cameras everywhere and, and register everything that customers do in a store, but this doesn't really scale. You know, this, this, you, somebody has to look at those videos, uh, you know, decode them and uh, track every consumer. This is a very, very expensive, labor intensive and so on. Um, so what, um, what a lot of retailers are trying to do is um, something that gets you close to having that kind of information, but not quite. So you can try to uh, put traffic counters at the entrance to the shop. You can see how many people pass by the store, how many people enter out of those that enter, how much time they spend in the store. You can try to track maybe mobile uh, phone signature of a customer. Uh, You can try to be more careful about tracking how much time your employees spend talking to a customer versus doing other tasks. Um, So all of those things, uh, if you can do more of them, you can obtain more information about what goes on in a retail store. And ultimately, um, you need to do something about this information because information by itself doesn't really help you. You need to come up with a decision support system that takes this information and suggests some actions that a store manager uh, can, uh, can ask employees to do. That makes a lot of sense. How do you think, you know, the optimal business model will be for, let's say, uh, sectors of retail where, um, you know, the, the salesperson is really, really important, like in specialty retail, where the knowledge of the salesperson and, you know, who's on the selling floor really dictates how much sales will happen. What, what do you think will be the optimal business model for, let's say, the specialty retail sector? So specialty retail is, is basically apparel, beauty, fashion, electronics, sporting goods. It's where the the retail typically sells one thing and it's, you know, the the sales staff tends to be quite knowledgeable about that topic. Certainly, if you go to specialty retail, um, like, uh, you know, high-end fashion uh, and so on, there the conversion rate is much, much smaller. So, you know, maybe one out of five or maybe even one out of ten of uh, customers who go into the store will buy something and typically the basket size is going to be very small, one or two items. So, um, uh, so definitely the role of store associates becomes uh, absolutely crucial um, because the store associate uh, is, is uh, necessary to explain the features of the product, explain the features of competing products, uh, possibly even engage customer into conversation about what's on promotion, what's uh, what kind of fashion is 
kind of a hot today and uh, what kind of things other customers are buying and so on and so forth. Uh, plus, there, is, there are a lot of opportunities for upsell and cross-sell, for example, selling matching things, you know, selling things that are, might be that might be sold in a different section of a store and the customer might not even know about them. So um, this is a situation where a uh, role of store associates is exceptionally uh, exceptionally important, which is why you need to have the right number of store, store associates. You also need uh, those store associates to be there at the right place at the right time, you know, not doing something uh, that you don't want them to do. And, and also, ultimately, what you want is you want to have those associates to be trained, to be actually able to respond to questions in a, in a you know um, in a cohesive way. So, Professor Nelson, um, do you think that there's much understaffing or overstaffing in retail stores today? I don't want to make complete kind of generalizations, but uh, I did look at um, several uh, major retail chains in the past. And inevitably, I came out with a conclusion that there is a pretty significant understaffing in retail stores, which which currently exists. Um, and there are many uh, many reasons for that. I think there is a fundamental problem with the uh, entire retail industry that thinks about um, staff as a kind of a fixed cost that has to be minimized in any way possible. Um, and and a lot of retail uh, store managers and executives forget that staff is there to generate sales. Um, and if you look at, at staffing that way, then you have to ask a question: not how I minimize staff, but how do I staff appropriately so I so that I maximize my profits and I maximize my sales. Um, and, and again, um, using several examples that I've seen in the past, I would say that um, over the years, uh, staff in, in most retailers has been cut several times. And very often you find companies that have pure kind of a bare bone staffing level, uh, which allows employees to do very, very basic things, but not talking to customers and not explaining features of the products and not doing the actual sales. I see. Actually, I, I've heard sometimes where there's a death spiral that happens where the retailer's sales are down, so they cut the staff, and the sales go down even more, and they cut the staff even more. So what, what can retailers do to fix this problem? Um, so one thing, as a, one very basic thing that retailers uh, should do is uh, stop um, trying to staff the stores based on forecast of sales, because this is this is where a vicious cycle comes from, right? So, for example, I forecast sales to be low for the next week. I I staff um, uh, my store at the low level, and there is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So I forecast sales to be low, I staff at the low level, and then sales turns out to be low because there are just not enough people to make sales higher, right? And then uh, for the following week, you know, I learn from that, and this is where the vicious cycle starts, right? So um, this is a fundamental issue uh, which arises when you try to staff based on forecast of sales, because your sales depend on depends on staffing, and the lower your staffing, the lower your sales. So what what you should try to do, of course, is uh, staff based on how many customers walk into the store, right? So uh, basically what you want to try to do is uh, make your staffing decisions based on forecast of traffic through the store, uh, which uh, should not really depend all that much on how many people are working in the store, right? Traffic is uh, is based on customer shopping patterns and maybe weather and maybe some some holidays and you know weekend versus weekday and so on and so forth. So if you can measure accurately traffic through the store and make forecasts based on uh, the traffic um, and then translate this forecast into how many people you need to be working in the store to address this number of customers, that should not lead to any vicious cycles. I see. That makes a lot more sense. 
<clears throat> so what kind of revenue increase? So let's say a retailer fixes their, un- their understaffing problem. What kind of revenue increase could a retailer expect to get by staffing properly? Uh, so I've, uh, I've done several projects in this space, as I mentioned, um, and, and the increases uh, that we've seen uh, ranged anywhere from 3 to 10% with, with, with probably 5 to 6, 7% uh, being the average. Um, and, and, you know, these, these were um, our kind of a theoretical estimates, but we've also done some experiments with, uh, with uh, retailers where we implemented our recommendations to increase staffing levels in certain stores, and we've seen uh, real sales increases uh, on the order of 5, 6 to 7 to 8 percent. Well, that's actually quite significant. I've, I've heard stats that, you know, because there's a lot of fixed costs in retail that, when you get these incremental sales or incremental revenue, um, it drops straight to the to the bottom line. So, I, I think um, most of the retailers listening to this podcast would think that six to eight ten, six to eight percent would be huge in terms of um, revenue increases. But how does how does a retailer know if they're if they're understaffed or, or for that matter overstaffed? How do they measure that? Um, well. Um... So this is where kind of a big data comes in, and and of course you need some data uh, to make this kind of estimate possible. You can try to look at um, uh, point of sales data and gather information from there. You need to look at uh, employment data. Uh, Ideally, you also want uh, some data from traffic counters to see uh, to see how um, the, the traffic through the store is aligned relative to uh, how many people you have in the store. Uh, so once you collect all of this data, uh, it, it's actually not that hard, or at least you know for me it's not that hard. Uh, but for you know many data scientists that um, that many retailers nowadays employ, um, to look at um, to look at the mismatch between um, traffic and uh, uh, and staffing level, um, and very often the picture becomes very obvious. Uh, you see that there are spikes in traffic uh, which are not anticipated by the retailer, um, and you see that the sales per uh, you know per square foot or per employee or you know per uh, some other metrics that uh, that retailers use. Uh, the sales just decreases because you simply don't have enough people to serve uh, all the customers in an appropriate fashion. I see. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah, so big data is definitely a big buzzword these days. But what have you found or what have you seen in terms of the individual makeup of uh, sales associates on the, on the selling floor? So, for instance, one common metric that a lot of retailers judge their employees on is this metric called sales per hour. Or another metric is, like, for instance, shopper yield, dollars divided by number of shoppers, or, you know, tenure at the retail, or, you know, how many call-outs do they do, or um, <clears throat> things like, for instance, um, uh, you know, what is their average transaction value? In terms of looking at these other met- metrics to try to build the best selling team on a sales floor possible, kind of like Moneyball style, what, what work has been done in that area, and what do you think is the potential of not just having the right number of sales associates, but having the right team of sales associates? Where, where are we at right now, Professor Nesson, in that area of research? Mm-hmm. Um, so um, certainly you can start um, digging deeper um, into um, into uh, not only just having the right number of people, but also what kind of people. At the very basic level, there is a big difference between having full-time labor on the shop floor versus part-time labor. Because uh, full-time labor typically is better trained, has longer tenure, you know, deeper knowledge of the products. Uh, and on, and all of that typically helps you uh, sell more and you know provide better help to the customer. Um, all too often, the retailers nowadays um, try to replace full-time labor with uh, part-time labor uh, for financial reasons, right? You don't pay uh, benefits necessarily to uh, part-time labor, and at some retailers, uh, part-time labor. 
uh, can be higher than 50% of all labor la labor hours used. Right? Um, so um, this, on the surface, this saves you some money, uh, but in reality, you typically take a hit uh, in terms of sales because part-time labor is not uh, does not have as high of a quality as uh, uh, full-time labor. Um, then, of course, we can start digging deeper. And one uh, striking thing that um, that I discovered in my work is that if you are able to look at uh, sales of individual employees, and some some retailers keep track of sales at the employee level, right? So each sale has to be has to have a, a name of the employee associated with it. So once you start looking at at sales by individual employees, there is a huge, huge, huge disparity. So there are uh, there are very very good salespeople who uh, day after day sell much more than average, um, and then then there are people who sell way 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 below average. And typically, uh, this kind of data is is rarely tracked by retailers. Once you uh, start measuring output from individual employees, um, you can you can do much uh, much much smarter scheduling decisions than you can do without this kind of information. I see. So, what kind of revenue increase have you seen? Um, and then that is, if the research is far enough along now, but what kind of revenues have you seen? by kind of having the right mix of employees. So, so you mentioned that for the, having the right number of employees, that can give a retailer somewhere between a six to 8% boost in revenue. What about having the right mix of employees? What, what, kind of, what kind of revenue increase can be expected by retailers for that kind of um, optimization? Um, so what, uh, what I have seen is um, something around uh, maybe three to 4% uh, is an increase that you can get from uh, kind of a smart team structure. I see. So it sounds like the, the first step to, you know, optimizing your selling floor is to have the right number. It sounds like the second step is to kind of have the right mix of employees. What What's the future of retail labor optimization on the selling floor? Uh, <laughs> so the future... Um, uh, the, f the future, uh, of course, should be um, s something where we know exactly um, at any point of time how many people uh, walked into the store. Uh, we, uh, we want to be able to predict this number relatively well so that uh, we staff uh, our stores to the traffic um and um and ideally uh we want to be able to do it on a on a relatively short notice using combination of uh, part time and uh, uh full time labor um we want also potentially to be able to uh cross staff across different stores and this is something that very very few um uh, retailer re retailers are, are doing because you know if you look at any big retail chain uh, you might have 5 10 uh, sometimes more stores within the same geographical area but they're typically managed completely independently and you know different stores might have different traffic patterns you might have different traffic in the in in a downtown store versus suburban store but you can actually relatively easily um exchange employees um and you know balance supply with demand um uh, that way uh, so hopefully in the future we should be able to do it um as well um in the future i would also hope that a store manager based information on current traffic point of sales uh, information maybe some weather information and you know some other information can make um, can make decisions on the fly, you know, uh, SMSing or you know maybe using Line or some other you know some messaging service um, to employees and saying, okay, I need five more people to come from the back room to the to the shop floor and start helping employees because ten minutes ago we had twenty people walking into the store and so we're gonna need more help. And by the way, half hour from now, I estimate that they will be going through a checkout register. So in uh, 30 minutes, I want uh, three more checkout registers to be open. 
And all of this should happen in real time based on, you know, a smart uh, uh, IT system that uses um, data from uh, traffic counters, from security video, from, you know, microphones, from mobile phone signature to predict those kinds of events and to send a, a, a message to store manager who simply approves uh, an SMS that goes out to uh, to employees. I also envision that uh, uh, that all sales uh, should be uh, associated with a particular sales manager. And uh, ultimately, what we want, we want an RFID probably linked to um, every product. And then uh, when the product goes through a checkout register, uh, we, we register that this product was sold by a particular employee. And then there is a leaderboard system that shows you how people are performing today, how you are doing relative to uh, certain KPIs, and salespeople immediately receive feedback on the kinds of things that they're doing right and wrong. I also envision um, um, uh, company-wide training programs for sales associates, uh, which uh, would typically happen through online engagements, through MOOCs or, you know, all, all kinds of other online training, which are not very expensive to uh, to implement. Um, and at the same time, um, this is a very good investment because store associates, again, are your first line of defense. That makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like uh, Uber for labor is coming just around the corner. So what's your thoughts and opinion in terms of What's a better way to measure the labor load on the staff? Is it better to use walk-in counts or is it better to use occupancy? Um, certainly, it seems to me like occupancy is, uh, is a better metric um, because uh, certainly whatever help that the customer is going to need within the store is uh, is going to be uh, is going to be more help that you need if you spend more time in the store, right? So, uh, so certainly just the traffic is not going to tell you the whole story. Um, uh, probably the basket size of a consumer, the, how many things the consumer is going to buy is uh, more or less proportional to, uh, to, the, uh, to the occupancy, to how much time the customer spends in the store. So uh, ultimately, it is this time, the time in the store that is more important, I think. So in our final minutes of this podcast, what do you think are some of the big major megatrends coming to retailers and what steps should companies take to kind of adapt to these uh, shifts happening in the industry? Mm -hmm. Um, I think probably the biggest one is, of course, Internet of Things, um, uh, and 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 we see it uh, we see it more and more in um, retail locations. Uh, we see a lot of opportunities for um, equipping uh, equipping uh, physical retail locations with uh, with various sensors, with various. Um, uh, you know, video, audio, pressure sensors, and so on, you know, putting RFID on products, putting RFID maybe on uh, shopping carts, uh, and so on. So I think this is going to be the biggest disruptor of uh, the way uh, the way we buy things in physical locations, uh, because ultimately Internet of Things um, in, in a physical retail location can bring us closer um, to um, to having full information, full picture about consumers, and to make to having better understanding of how people buy and what they buy and how we can help them. Professor Nelson, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, for having me. This was a very interesting discussion. 